Hello, everyone, and welcome to Uncivil Law, where we learn through the misfortunes of others. If you're enjoying this legal education content, please remember to subscribe. It helps the channel grow. For today's case, we're dealing with the special needs of children and when they have special educational needs and what facilities the schools have to provide to people with learning disabilities and other special requirements. This is the case of Andrew F. versus Douglas County School District. In this case, there was a student who required special needs, and the school district probably wasn't giving the needs that were required. The parents then went to a private school and they want to have money for the funding of that education. So the, requirement, so the question is, when the school district doesn't provide, can the parents get money to go to a private school? Let's get started with this. The Individuals with Disability Education Act, the IDEA Act, offer state federal funds to assist in educating children with disabilities. So the federal government would like states to do better on educating people with disabilities. And when the federal government wants to do something, the way that they often accomplish this is by with money. So the federal government says, here's a law that would apply to you. And the states say, no. They say, here's some money. And the states say, yay, money. And so then they're bound by the federal law because they take the money, so they take the things that go with it. Among other things, the state must provide a free, appropriate public education, also known as a FAPE for short, to all eligible children. So the state has an obligation to take care of the children, the federal government provides money, as a result, they're bound to the relevant federal law and standards. A state that is covered by this relevant law must provide a disabled child with special education and related services in conformity with the individual educational program for that child, also known as an IEP. The IEP is the centerpiece of a state's educational delivery system for these children. A comprehensive plan prepared by the child's team, which includes children, school officials, and the parents, a plan must be drafted in compliance with a detailed set of procedures. The relevant law requires that each child's individualized plan include a statement of the child's present levels of academic achievement and functionalized performance, describe how the child's disability affects a child's involvement and progress in general curriculum, and set out a measurable annual goal, including academic and functional goals, along with a description of how the child's progress towards meeting those goals will be gauged. So there's a lot of standards here from the federal government on if you're going to accept this money, here's what you have to do. We're going to provide you some money and we're also going to apply some standards. So you must show for each child how you're going to accomplish the goals of teaching this child given the child's disability, which seems fair because, again, you're accepting the money with it. Parents and educators often agree about what these plans should contain, but of course, not always. When disagreements arise, the parents may turn to dispute resolution procedures established by the relevant law. The parties may resolve their differences informally through, for example, preliminary meetings or somewhat more formally through a mediation process. If these measures fail to provide an agreement, the parties may proceed to what the Act calls a due process hearing before a state or local educational agency. And if those fail, the parties may seek remedy in state or federal court. So there's a whole bunch of processes here that the federal government specifies. Again, if states want to accept the money they're offering. Then these are the then these are the procedures the state must use. They, they, the parties, the parents have a right to object, and they have to go through these due process proceedings if they want to accept the money. So again, you accept the money, you accept the things that go with it. Andrew attended school in the Douglas County School District from preschool through fourth grade. Every year, his individualized team drafted an individualized plan addressed to his particular educational needs. By the fourth grade, however, his parents became dissatisfied with the progress. Although Andrew displayed a number of strengths, his teacher described him as a humorous child with a sweet deposition and showed concerning for friends. He exhibited multiple behaviors that indicated in his ability to access learning in the classroom. So there are multiple things that prevent him from learning properly. Andrew would, for example, scream in class, climb over furniture and other students, and occasionally run away from school. He was afflicted by several fears of commonplace things like flies, spills, and public restrooms. As Andrew's parents saw it, his academic and functional progress had effectively stalled. 
Andrew's individualized plan largely carried over the same basic goals and objectives from one year to the next, indicating that he was failing to make meaningful progress towards his aims. So his parents removed Andrew from public school and enrolled him at a place called Firefly Autism House, a private school that specialized in educating people with autism. So in this particular case, the parents felt unsatisfied with what the public school was doing. Although they attended public school from early years until fourth grade, the parents say that the school just kept recycling the same plan over and over again without any modifications adapting to the kids' current needs and so failed in its individualized goals. The parents then resorted to enrolling their kid in a private school because they say that, say that the school failed to meet the mission that was required. And so that becomes a problem that might need to be having some redress. Andrew did much better at the Firefly Private Academy. The school developed a behavioral intervention plan that identified Andrew's most problematic behaviors and set up particular strategies for addressing them. In November of 2010, some six months after Andrew started classes at Firefly, his parents again met with representatives of the Douglas County School District. The district presented a new plan. The parents considered the plan no more adequate than the one that had been previously proposed and accordingly rejected it. They are particularly concerned that the stated plan for addressing behavior did not meaningly differ from that of the previous plan for fourth grade, despite the fact that his experience at Firefly had suggested that he would benefit from a different approach to the school, the public school that said, we're going to basically have the same plan, even though his experience at private school would suggest that a different plan might be more beneficial for his behavior. In February of 2012, Andrew's parents filed a complaint with the Colorado Department of Education seeking the public sector to reimburse for the private school's tuition. To qualify for this level of relief, they are required to show that the public school district had not provided Andrew with a plan in a timely manner prior to his enrollment at the private school. An administrative law judge disagreed with this determination and denied relief to the parents. Andrew's parents sought relief in the federal district court, giving due weight to the decision of the administrative law judge the district court affirmed, and the 10th Circuit also affirmed. The Court of Appeal recited language from a prior case called Raleigh that stated that the inst instruction and services furnished to children with disabilities must be calculated to confer some educational benefit. The court noted that it had long interpreted this language to mean that a child's individualized plan is adequate as long as it's calculated to confer an educational benefit that is merely more than de minimis. So based on a prior case called Rowley, the 10th Circuit said, look, all these plans have to do is provide a benefit that is more than de minimis and provide some benefit. They doesn't have to provide much benefit, just a mere bare minimum will be enough. And that was based on the prior interpretation. So the Supreme Court is going to take another crack at this and determine whether or not the Tenth Circuit is interpreting the prior case of Rowley correctly. These statements from the prior case law of Rowley in isolation do support the school district's argument, but the district court makes too much of them. Our statement that the face of this law provides no explicit standard must be evaluated along our statement that the standard was implicit in the act. More importantly, the school district's reading of these isolated statements runs headlong into several points on which Rowley is clear. For instance, just after saying that the act requires instructions that's sufficiently clear to convey some benefit, we know that the determination of when disabled children are receiving sufficient benefits presents a difficult problem. While Rowley declined to articulate an overarching standard to evaluate the adequacy of education provided under the act, the decision and the statutory language points to a general approach. To meet its substantive obligation under the relevant law, a school must offer a plan that's reasonably calculated to enable a child to make progress appropriate in the light of the child's circumstances, and that plan must enable the child to make that progress. That the progress contemplated by an individualized plan must be appropriate in light of the child's circumstances should come as no one's surprise. A focus on a particular child is at the core of the relevant law. The instruction offered must be a specialized design to meet a child's unique needs through an individualized program. The individualized plan provisions reflected in Raleigh, expectation that for most children, a plan will involve integration into a regular classroom 
and individualized specialized education calculated to achieve advancement from grade to grade. Every plan begins by describing a child's present level of achievement, including explaining how a child's disability affects the child's involvement and progress in the general educational curriculum. The school district protests that these provisions impose only procedural requirements, a checklist of items that the plan must address, not a substantive standard enforceable in court. But the procedures are there for a reason, and the focus provides insight into what it means for the law's definition to meet the unique knowledge of a child with disability. So the school district tries to say, well, these are only procedural requirements, not substantive. And the Supreme Court says that's kind of true, but the procedures are there for a reason. So they're not exactly substantive in so much as like, here are things that you have to meet. But the, the, the procedure is there for a reason, to try to establish what those things are. So to say, well, these aren't objective, these aren't merit-based, is kind of missing the point. You actually have to try to establish the plan. And if you follow, it's a product by process, basically. If you're not following the process properly, how can you expect to get the right result? So the Supreme Court's like, yeah, you got to actually do these things. It's kind of important. The school district protests that these provisions impose only procedural requirements, a checklist of items that the plans must address, not a substantive standard enforceable by court. These procedures, oh, I already did that. Sorry, strike that. We will not attempt to elaborate on what an appropriate progress will look like from case to case. Is the nature of the act and the standard that we adopt to resist such an effort? The accuracy of a plan turns on unique circumstances of the child for whom it was created. The absence of a blight, blight line rule, however, should not be mistaken for an invitation to the courts to substitute their own notions of sound educational policy for those of the school authorities in which they review. At the same time, deference is based on application of expertise and exercise of judgment by school authorities. The acts vex these officials with responsibility for decisions of critical importance to the life of a disabled or handicapped child. The nature of these processes, from the initial consultation through state administrative proceedings, ensures that a parent and a school representative. The nature of these processes, from the initial consultation through the state administrative proceedings, ensures that a parent. Wow. That wasn't my fault, by the way. The screen just blanked out on me for no reason. Let's try that again. The nature of this process, from the initial consultation through the state administrative proceeding, ensures that parents and a school representative will fully air their respective opinions on the degree of progress of a child's individualized plan should pursue. By the time a dispute reaches court, school authorities will have a complete opportunity to bring their expertise and judgment to bear on areas of disagreement. A reviewing court may be fairly expected to those authorities to be able to offer a cogent and responsive explanation for the decisions that shows that the individualized plan is reasonably calculated to enable the child to make progress appropriate to the light of particularized circumstances. So that is the end of the case of Andrew F. versus Douglas County. In this case from the U.S. Supreme Court, we learned a little bit more about what a school is required to do when it comes to a person with learning disabilities or other handicaps. We learn what the school district is required to produce, and we learn that the school does fail to do that, that the parents can seek remedies in damages for a private school that is able to. So this was very informative and speaks to what the schools are required to do in terms of individualized plans for disabled children. And that brings us to the end of the discussion of this case. Thank you so much for being part of the Uncivil Law family. If you enjoyed this legal education content, please hit the subscribe button. It really helps the channel grow. We appreciate your continuing support. Until later, my friends, cheers and goodbye.